everyone. Welcome to day two of the Innovation Fest. I'm Karina Glover, the moderator for this very important conversation about women changing perceptions in male-dominated industries. I have four amazing powerhouses who are going to be sharing their experiences, um, their expertise, and sharing in on the important conversation of how women can succeed, how young girls can prepare for success, even in a male-dominated industry, in a male-dominated world. Um, I am bringing to the table Four ladies, uh, Dixie James, she is President and Chief Operating Officer of Einstein Healthcare Network. She has over 15 years of experience in the healthcare industry. I'm not going to go too deep into the introductions because they're amazing. I want them to be able to share a little bit more about their background. Um, second, I have Yvette Young. Yvette Young is a multi-talented artist. She sings, she songwrites, she plays guitar, piano, and she's also touring with a band. So we're really excited to hear what she has to say. <clears throat> Third, I have Patrice Banks. Patrice is founder and CEO of Girls Auto Clinic. Her business is really cool. She started her own um, auto repair shop. She hires women mechanics, and then while her customers are waiting to get their car repaired on, they can also get their nails done. So if you're in the Philly area, be sure to check them out. And then having some technical difficulties, but coming back to the screen in just a second, Chris, Chris has been named the Queen of Cannabis because she was president and CEO of Terra Vida Holistic Center, and she operates through high volume medical marijuana dispensaries in Philadelphia. So ladies, welcome to the digital state. Thank you so much for your time and coming to the table to have this very important conversation with us. So my first question, I'm gonna um, hear this question to Yvette, and that is, tell us a little bit about your background and what's happened to position you to be in the career that you're in right now. Get my hand back. Oh, get my hand back. So, uh, uh, so I, I, okay. Yeah. So I really feel like uh, I kind of fell into the current career that I have, which is a touring musician just through luck. Like it's honestly being in the right place at the right time because the music industry is pretty like saturated. Um, and yeah, I guess I, I went to art school. Actually, I studied um, visual performing arts education and fine arts, got a double major, and I was working at a school teaching kids for a while um, and just playing music for fun and just for, like, personal therapy reasons, and I would just post stuff online, and then pretty soon, like, I got so occupied doing music uh, that I had to quit the teaching job, and I guess I here I am now just touring and, you know, writing music and, and actually being able to live off of my passion, which is really crazy. <laughs> so I love that. yeah, that's my I, story. I how, yeah, I love how you said that you got into it kind of through therapy and how the music was healing you. And now mm -hmm. you are putting your heart back into music to inspire other people. Um, I'm very excited yeah. to hear more about that journey. Thank Patrice, you. What yeah. about, tell us a little bit about your background and how you ended up in your industry. Yes. Um, I, so I love telling this story because when people find out that I'm an auto mechanic, that I work on cars, that I teach women about cars, they assume I grew up knowing about cars or that my dad was a mechanic. And I tell them, no, in fact, I called myself an auto airhead. I was an engineer. And even as an engineer, I felt like I didn't understand my car. I hated all of my automotive experiences. I thought I was being taken advantage of by mechanics, right? And worse, I needed a man to come with me to help me anytime something happened with my car or when I went to buy a car. It wasn't a very empowering position to be in as an engineer and a woman who thought I was empowered, right? I don't need a man. Turns out, yeah, I did for my car. <laughs> so um, I started looking for a female mechanic. I was tired of having these poor experiences and not feeling confident with the choices that I made with my car. So I Google female mechanic um, and I ask friends around and, and I can't find one even on Google. This is in like 2011. So as I started talking to friends um, and, and people that I knew, they all had the same experience as other women felt this way. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to have to go back to school and learn how to work on cars. Since I can't find a female mechanic, I'm going to do it. So I enrolled in automotive technology school and I started, as soon as I was learning, I was teaching women. So I started doing car care workshops and I've been doing them since 2015. 
um, every month. I wrote a car care book that was published by Simon & Schuster. Um, and now we have, of course, the Girls Auto Clinic Repair Center that caters to women, right? We have a place that you can come, that you trust your mechanic. We hire women mechanics. Um, it's going to be a great experience. You know you're going to feel confident about the choice you make with your car. We have a great kids play area. Of course, the nail salon so you can get your nails done while you wait for your car. So it's really about channeling our attention and, and to women who are the number one customer in the automotive industry. Actually, by far, ladies, we hold more driver's licenses than men across all age groups. So the future is female. And I want to make sure that women are involved in these conversations, that women are empowered in the automotive industry. We're in positions of influence and power. And that's what Girls Auto Clinic does. I, I love that. And you touched on something really important that the the creation of your business stemmed from a problem that not only you personally experienced, but so many other women, which is your target audience, also could relate to. So congratulations on all of your success thus far. And the next time I need to tune up, if I'm in your area, I will definitely pull up to, to get that done. Um, Dixie, yeah. how the heck did you end up in healthcare and like the boss of all things healthy. Thank you. Um, it's an interesting story, actually. I um, I started off uh, pre-med because, you know, growing up, you're, you're only thought, taught there's a handful of things you can be, and I thought I wanted to be a doctor, and I learned very quickly after a summer internship um, after my freshman year. It was more of a shadow ship um, after some very interesting interactions with bodily fluids and um, a couple of very... Um, uh, interesting uh, sessions with uh, interactions with patients that, and, and very traumatizing scenarios, I realized that I don't know that I was cut out for direct patient care, but what I did learn that summer is I, I had a love for medicine, and um, fortunately, the cardiologist I was working with that summer said, well, why don't you explore the business side of healthcare? And of course, I didn't know what that was or what that meant, And um, but that was the beginning of my journey. I took a, a left there and uh, researched it and never looked back. And uh, now I understand that my my impact is supposed to be in healthcare, just not um, in the operating room. But I, I feel that I've been able to have maybe even a bigger impact, uh, for, certainly for the communities that um, we serve. And I've always been committed to working at institutions that have a commitment to underserved communities. And I feel like that's what I'm able to do. So it's part of my passion, even though I'm not in the operating room. I love that. And you kind of touched on something we're going to get into a little bit later down the line. But like one of the questions we're going to ask, if you guys can think about it now, is one of, what is one of the greatest lessons you've learned in your journey? And you kind of touched on realizing passion and career might shift, some, shift sometimes. So the queen of cannabis, Chris, um, some of us are at the edge of our seats trying to figure out how did you step into this industry? Tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Sorry, I had some technical challenges and that stresses me out. Um, so I am a retailer. I was a merchant for 25 years. Um, I worked at Bob Scott at the Parker Store, which is the largest family-owned Parker Store chain in the country, and then moved on to David's Bridal. Um, from there, I had a manufacturing company and then a political strategy firm. Working as an employee for a company, I had big ideas, mail run, and no one was listening. So we were mostly women who were the workforce, but the men at the top kept bringing in other men at the top, and they kept going out. So I decided to go into business with some partners, and within a year took over a wholesale manufacturing business with um, a contract with the Department of Justice. That ended in 2008, like a brick wall came down uh, when the market came down. Fortunately, I thought to start a marketing firm beforehand. Something I love is food and my passion for food, and I thought I could be a food reviewer. Didn't really work out that well, but it spun off as social media came to be. I followed the trend, started a social media company, and then that fell into my love and my passion for social justice, and I went into politics. So I was political strategist for 16 years and started watching cannabis legislation throughout the country. I knew I wanted to get into it because I knew I could make a lot of money. What I didn't know was how many people I could help. So when I saw a video of a little girl named Charlotte in Colorado whose parents were afraid to give her cannabis 
that she ended up brain dead before they did because of her seizures, she just died this year at 14. She was two when that happened. That's how I ended up here. <laughs> yeah. Wow. What what a story. Um, and, and I'm sorry to hear about the, the young lady who passed. Um, I'm sure all of you have experienced different challenges from the beginning of your career up into where you are now and the influence and the power and the position that you have now. So Patrice, can you start off by sharing a little bit of insight on um, from the time that you thought of the idea of your business up until now, what were some of the roadblocks that you experienced and what uh -huh. did you overcome that challenge? So um, a lot of roadblocks that you experienced because you just don't expect, you know, as an entrepreneur, you're just trying things out, right? I tell, I tell people, I don't know what I'm doing, but nobody really knows what they're doing. And being an entrepreneur is really just about putting yourself out there. And um, I'm putting myself out there in a really male dominated industry in an industry I'm not an expert or I don't have a lot of experience in. So a lot of the um, challenges that I faced in the beginning um, came from really looking for my building. When I was looking for a building uh, for the repair center, there were three that fell through. Like I, every single one that I found that I liked, I was so excited. We'd start working with the owner. We were figuring out like how much it would cost for us to open there. And I would spend maybe one, two, three months sometimes on trying to secure this location and it would fall through. And it took me like two years to find the perfect location. And every time it would fall through, I, I want to quit. I'm like, I'm never going to find this repair center. I'm never going to open. And at the time I was a little bold and maybe, I don't know if I should have did it this way or not. I was telling everyone I'm going to open a repair center with female mechanics, right? There's going to be a nail salon there. So you can get your nails done. I didn't have a location. I didn't know one female mechanic, right? This was just my vision and my dream. And I believed in myself and I started every day, one foot in front of the other. How am I going to make this happen? And those were some, I remember the big challenges in the beginning was it wasn't happening quick enough. Any, anytime I thought something was going to come together, that was going to make the dream come true and it fell apart. It's devastating. And it almost makes you want to quit to think this is never going to happen for me, but I'm glad that I stuck with it because the fourth location is by far, by far the greatest, right? They say hindsight's 2020. I'm so glad those three locations fell through. Um, for many, many reasons, this is the best place. So you got to trust the process, you know, and um, make sure that you're sticking with it. You're persistent. You're consistent. Um, putting yourself out there still every day. It's one foot in front of the other, um, you know, and that's kind of the hardest part about entrepreneurship is having that persistence and consistency in the face of failure in these challenges. So I just met you 10 minutes ago, digitally, uh -huh. and I'm already so proud of you. Um, congratulations. <laughs> and, and I always tell people, especially people, starting, <laughs> yes, I, especially people thinking about starting a business, I tell them passion is not enough. Like you need to be yeah. so disciplined that you refuse to give up no matter how hard it gets. Um, so I have a few more questions, but I wanted to make sure the audience knows that um, we will be doing a Q&A starting in about 10 to 15 minutes. So please send in your questions early so you don't forget them. Um, but Eva, I would love to have you answer the same question. You, you mentioned that when you started um, doing music and, and writing and playing different instruments, it was originally a form of therapy for you. So at what point did it change from uh, a form of therapy to something you wanted to do artistically and creatively for as a career and what were some of the roadblocks you experienced being in the music industry yeah man that's a loaded one so i guess i should have specified earlier i got into playing guitar uh, originally because i was really sick in the hospital like uh basically in a nutshell my heart wasn't working anymore and i was experiencing a lot of depression um and you know i grew up playing piano and violin those were all imposed on me by my parents. So I never really actually liked it. And then actually um, I had a lot of unhealthy perfectionism in me where I guess like it was affecting my mental health. So in the hospital, um, I wanted, I, I kind of just always wanted to play guitar. So I took up guitar as, as a way to just write songs and as an outlet. Um, I guess I should also specify that uh, I had a heart problem because of the eating disorder that I had at the time um, that stemmed from my perfectionism. And 
for me, uh, guitar was such a beautiful, healthy thing for me to take up because number one, it was like music on my own terms. So it was nobody dictating like what I was supposed to do with it. Um, I wasn't being forced to be competitive with anyone else. Like it was legitimately something that I took up as a way to uh, just explore a new outlet. And it also took my focus away from my external appearance, uh, appearance and it um, brought my confidence, uh, my source of confidence to what I could do with my hands and what I could like think of with my brain. So it was like a really healthy shift in like my self image, uh, which is kind of stuck with me to this day. Uh, and then ever since then, I always was really passionate about music being such an empowering outlet, not only for young women, but for really anyone going through something like art, music. I think these are things that we don't uh, value enough in, I guess, our society. Um, I don't want to generalize, but it does feel like sometimes these pursuits are perceived as frivolous. And I actually think it's like such an important thing uh, for young people growing up to like develop their self image and learn how to like have a voice when they're not necessarily the most outspoken. So, uh, yeah, I guess that's the first part of the question. The second part of the question roadblocks. Um, so I mentioned that I was a teacher at first and I wanted to go into teaching because I was really passionate about, I guess, helping kids find an outlet and find their source of confidence. Um, and, pretty soon I had to decide when I wanted to quit teaching to go into being in a band, which is really daunting. Uh, so the first roadblock was figuring out like when was a good point to jump ship. I think sometimes quitting is actually really important. Like I, being a perfectionist, I was taught that quitting is really bad. And I think the first moment that I was like, you know what, now I'm going to give my passion, like my real passion, like, you know, a, a good, honest attempt. I think that was the first big decision I ever made for myself. And ever since I did that, there was no turning back. Um, and another big obstacle that I, I still face to this day is knowing when I have to compromise. Like sometimes I feel like, uh, I don't know, being a band leader, being someone who has to, you know, hurt uh, everyone together and get things done. Um, sometimes it's, it's really scary. It's a lot of decision-making um, on the fly even. So I think knowing when, I guess knowing when to stay true to my convictions and knowing when uh, it's okay to like stray from that has been a big one. So I don't, I guess that's more of like an ongoing thing. It's not like one specific hurdle. It's, it's more like, knowing when to stick up for yourself and knowing when to stick to your guns. You just dropped like five gems. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, of course. So the next question I really want to gear towards Dixie Ann and Chris. And one of the things uh, that Yvette kind of mentioned earlier was, you know, expectations in society. And, and we kind of have this perception that only certain jobs or certain industries or certain positions are geared towards men. And so Dixie, and I'd love for you to go first, you know, when you were um, starting to, what, elevate in your career and, and in your job, did you feel any resistance now or in the past with, because you were a woman? Yeah, that's a, um, that's a really uh, good question. I will say that I think that resistance even started early on with my aspirations to be a physician. I had an uncle tell me, you really need to focus on trying to be a nurse. And even then, I was, uh, you know, I was in middle school at the time. I knew what that meant. That meant that, you know, that wasn't a career for women. And, um, you know, I, I tease them now that, you know, the doctors work for me. Um, but, you know, I think as I, I progressed, um, I, I certainly encountered a lot of barriers, specifically as it related to, to being a woman, also obviously being a, a minority woman, being young, I was oftentimes the only one of many things in the room. And um, and so there, there, with that comes a lot of doubt, certainly. And, um, you know, the way to, to overcome that for me is it goes back to a little bit of what um, Patrice talked about, and, and I think you bet touched on a little bit. It really is an uncompromising and like superhero commitment to I can do this and I believe in me and um, you just it's a pursuit that is relentless and it's like I I'm gonna do this I don't care who thinks I can uh, and I'm gonna do it and I'm gonna actually be excellent at it and so it's, it's that mm -hmm. other um, that that pride that kicks in so it, it sort of in, 
in that comment, I remember that and, and subsequent conversations with people who were sort of like, yeah, you know, there's other things you can do. I'm like, no, but I'm going to do this. And it, may, it, just, it just reinforced my desire to, to do it and to do it well and to do it in a way that no one else, no other woman coming up via whatever ethnicity or race would also have to encounter that doubt and have to push past that you don't belong here because I'm going to do it now and then it's going to be easier for you. So I always had that balance also working in the back of my mind that it wasn't just for me, um, but it was it was bigger because I, my opportunities were certainly laid by the groundwork of people that pushed out other doors before me. And so I just have to keep pushing so that it gets easier every every generation later. We're, we're pushing those numbers. And, you know, right now in healthcare. There's only about 18% of the women in the industry are in the C-suite, so there's a lot of room for a lot of us to get to the table, and so we got I got to get busy making room for them. I love that, and one of the favorite one of the favorite things I say to myself is one of the consequences if I quit, um, yeah. not thinking just about me, but the people after me, and you kind of touched on that too, like it's bigger than you. And you said the doctors work for you, okay, girl, uh, Chris. When you stepped into the cannabis industry, did you feel, or it, even in the previous career that you had, um, did you feel any resistance building your career and, and at all feel belittled because you were a woman? How did you handle that if you ever felt that? Yeah, I, I first want to say that it is not lost on me, but I'm the only white woman on this call. And I cried when I saw that. I am so proud to be here with you ladies. And I got to tell you, you're amazing. Amazing. Um, anyway, uh, what was I was going to say. So, um, yes, so there are no women in Canada. There's one huge badass in the industry and everybody else just exists to put their name on an application to make white men rich. When I won, my boyfriend's father, or my daughter's boyfriend's father, said to me, oh, so somebody somebody paid you to do this? Because <laughs> that's the assumption, because I'm seeing that, right? Yeah. Everyone I met I did, that. did that. Everyone. Prior to that, when we decided to apply, we started approaching a professional. And everybody said, I know you think you can win because you're diverse. But Lindy Snyder has money, and these men have power, and everybody, I said, this is my home. These are my people. I don't care about money or power. This is about community. And what we found out very quickly was this is truly about community. When I stepped foot in the room with these growers, I told them who I was. This is what I'm going to do is what I need. This is what I will give you. Everyone laughed at me. Everyone. I run the three top dispensaries in Pennsylvania because I'm a woman. And because people are starting to recognize that this needs to end. I'm end. I have men and women who will travel hours to come to my dispensary because I'm a woman. I didn't know that going into this. I really didn't. It was important to me, but I'm so thrilled where we're starting to head that people start to care. But <laughs> no one wanted any parts of me. Our license writer charged the men $100,000 and got ownership and only charged me 40000 with no ownership because he didn't think I had a shot of winning because I was a woman. And I got points for being female. And they still didn't think I could do it. And now I've got an entire team of female executives running the largest marijuana dispensary organization in Pennsylvania. Congratulations, Chris. I, I'm seeing it Thank you. in a lot of your responses. I'm hearing not so much passion because you need that, but I'm hearing a lot of resilience and persistence and, and almost stubbornness. Um, and so let's talk to the ladies who are watching who are maybe in a transitional period, maybe thinking about going back to school for the first time, or uh, maybe thinking about starting that business, or maybe they're transitioning from a career that they would love to a completely different 
career or industry that they never thought they could be in. What would you say to those ladies who are in the very beginning that you were one in? What advice would you give these ladies? Did you, you uh, yes, I, I, I okay. would, Sorry. my <laughs> advice, because I was, when I went back to school, I was in automotive technology school during the, I'm thir- I was maybe 31. I'm in class with a bunch of 18 year old boys and white, white men. They were white kids. I was the oldest, the only girl, and I'm an engineer from DuPont. So you think I'd come in with a little bit more uh, confidence, but I was terrified. I had never touched a tool in my life. I didn't know anything about cars and I was scared to look stupid. And so mm-hmm. I found myself um, falling back right? Um, Asking for help and guys would push me out of the way and, you know, go and put the part on and I'd stand there and just look at them. And I thought, this is why they think women don't want to work on cars, that we're just here to be cute, that we're just here because we like guys. And it's not because we don't want to be here and we don't want to learn because we're scared to look stupid. We're scared to write, like step up to the challenge or lean in because we're, we're so used to being in the background and we don't want to be ridiculed. We don't have that confidence that men have to mess up and be wrong. And when I realized that I was doing that, I thought to myself, Patrice, you're crazy. What are you here for? Right? Like you are a smart girl. You can learn this, anything that they know you can learn. And if you mess up, so what? There are people out there who are going to help you. Who cares if they're going to make fun of you or say something, you're on a mission. Find the people who want to help you get in there, learn, break some stuff, mess up. Right. And, and you realize that that's what gets you better, faster. That's what gets you um, smarter, faster. And by the end of the class, you know, I'm always raising my hand, answering all types of asking and answering all types of questions. I became like the star student and the boys know, like, she's serious. Like we don't mess with her. She came here to get stuff done. And that's exactly, you know, the persona that I give off now. I'm glad that I had that experience with those 18 year old boys, because now when I go in front of people like, you know, Damon John uh, uh, for doing a business pitch and all these other investors, I have that confidence. I bring into the room saying anything that, you know, I can learn, right? Like I deserve to be in this room. I deserve to be at this table. I'm not scared (laughs) of what you know, and I don't, right? Uh, In fact, that often can be your advantage because you look at things sometimes a little bit different when you're coming in without all the knowledge that everyone else may have to it. So embrace it, embrace being new, embrace not knowing, right? But also don't fall back. Don't make yourself small because you're afraid to look stupid. That's your, that's how you're going to learn, right? And be prepared, you know, know your stuff. We know as women, you have to be better, especially if you're a woman of color. Um, you have to work harder and be better and prove yourself more. But that's what we do as women, you know? So we're capable. And so that's the advice I would give to them. Yvette, do you want to follow that? What advice would you give to the women who are stepping into a new season and into a transitional period, um, starting where, you know, level one, what would you say to these ladies? Well, I think one thing that has helped me personally is really taking the time to understand who I am and what I want to stand for, because I think everything you do, I mean, everything I've done some of it has been accident, but more and more, like as I explore this career, I realize that like I have to be really deliberate with the messages that I put out there, especially because I have an audience of people watching me. And, uh, you know, it is daunting to think that I might influence their decisions uh, going forward. So I try to, you know, conduct myself with uh, grace and, and just being deliberate with my actions. Um, I would say stick to your convictions. Uh, if it feels wrong on your gut, don't do it. And if you have to struggle really hard to make something work, it's probably just not meant. Um, and it's okay to walk away when something's not working out for you. And it's okay to, you know, really stick up for the things that you genuinely want and not compromise. That's solid. Great advice. Um, where we go, Dixie Ann, what, what would you add? Um, if, if anything, you know, I, and I, because I will just say, I echo a lot of what the women say. The only thing I'd add, which is consistent with it, is also to um, appreciate the uniqueness of your of your journey. I mean, I think a lot of times mm-hmm. you can, we feel like we uh, have to have had some pretty mapped out plan, and and if you don't follow it to a T, then somehow you've messed things up, and it, it it trips you up. And I think you bring 
experiences from every season of your life and that actually adds to the uniqueness that makes you able and capable for whatever you've got next and so it's okay to just use all of that and lean on it the good the bad and the ugly we learn experience is the best teacher and don't waste any of it you know mistakes learn from those and then and then be very um intentional and, and leaning into it and enjoying the journey and, and getting comfortable being uncomfortable as you stretch yourself because i think greatness is on the other side of that stretch and um it, it, and you just got to know that in life whenever you're reaching for that next step it's not going to feel normal it's not going to feel comfortable but if you have to push past that and i think using your uniqueness and bringing your voice to the table is how you get through it i love it so ladies, we've had a ton of questions submitted in through the Q&A. So we're gonna switch gears. Um, and the first question, if Chris, you can pick a, um, answer this one first. It says, how do you know when to take, to take the jump and launch into entrepreneurship? Additionally, how do you know if your idea is a good idea? Wow, that's a tough question. I guess I would say, I, I would say you don't. Both of those, you don't. Um, you, the first question I would ask yourself is, how risk adverse are you? Because there's two paths to take in life. You can be an entrepreneur and be a small business owner, or you can collect a paycheck and build a career. But both are great paths, but they have both, you know, have downside to them. Being a business owner is a really risky business. COVID has shown us that. We have businesses that closed because they didn't have enough cash to last. It's really, really, really hard. So you have to know going into it that you could lose everything or you could end up where you want to be. What I would say is the ideas that you have, get as close to it as you can. So if you wanted to be a salon owner or you wanted to open an automotive, go in and work for free. Work for as many small businesses as you can for free. Every stop you make will bring you into a better direction and make you a stronger person. I tell my young people all the time, if they decide working for me isn't for them, I promise them that at some point in their future, they will learn something from being part of this whirlwind startup that we've done that will benefit them in the future. Just get as much experience, do it for free so you can enter places you would never be able to, and then make the decision how much risk you can take on. Patrice, do you want to answer that? It seemed like you were kind of yes. agreeing with something, <laughs> yes. something with your time. <laughs> yes, I worked for free for two years. Before I left my corporate America job making 100 k a year, I went to any repair center, any place that I said, listen, I'm an engineer, whatever I can do to help you, I just, I wanna learn. I wanna learn how to work on cars. I wanna learn how to run this business. And that's how I started. One other advice that I would give people, it is about risk. You don't also wanna leave your current job until you know that you've got enough money and savings, right? Like just don't make that jump without having a plan of when do you, you know, you plan on making money, kind of project that. It's never correct, but it's always important to have a plan. <laughs> the plan won't always work out, but having the plan is better than not having one. So what I made that jump, um, from going to you know a six-figure job to work, getting paid six hundred dollars a week as a mechanic, um, I had been working for free for two years. I had a bunch of money saved up, and I had a plan on right finding a repair center and get, and getting um, raising money. Uh, so that's really important. I love the uh, Chris mentioning working for free because I understand a lot of people don't like to do that right now. And I understand that that's hard. People need money and they want to be paid. Um, but if you're looking to build in, a, in an industry or in a field that you know nothing about, that's the quickest way you're going to get skills is by working for someone who's free, for free. And trust me, there are smart, talented people out there that would take someone to work for them for free. You want to work for me for free and learn how to run a business? I'll take it. I need some help. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and one thing I would add to that, Cecilia, um, I'm a second time founder. Uh, I've also raised venture capital. And one thing I can say is that the only thing worse than um, a failed product and a failed business is having a failed product and business and then having time and money that you cannot get back. So do not start a business based off assumptions. Take the time to do your research. And, and do market research with your target audience to make sure that you are solving a problem that they need 
that the messaging that you come out with for your uh, future website matches the messaging that resonates with them and deeply understood every problem that they are experiencing. So your entire business model is, is customized to solving their problems so they are recurring customers and not one-time buyers. Um, so Michelle has a question. It says, women tend to wait until they are ready for an opportunity. We think we're not prepared to do things. What advice would you have for us women to start taking charge and stop waiting until we're more qualified? Dixie Ann. Okay, um, that's a really good question. And I, and I agree. Um, one of the things I, I learned very early um, in sitting in rooms of, of um, Caucasian men is that they don't ever doubt. They, they're like, they just assume they're right and they throw it out there and then they, and then, and you're like, wait a minute, I don't think that's actually correct. But they, they say it with so much confidence and they go in. And so when it's taught me not to say things that aren't true, but it has taught me that, you know, you have to put yourself out there and you have to believe in yourself in a way. Cause I always tell, um, the folks that I work with and mentor, whether you believe you can or you believe you can't, you're right, right? It starts there. What do you believe you can do? And, and, and you have to put doubt to the side and you have to know that there's nothing you can't figure out and someone else is gonna is gonna come up there and they're gonna do it and they may not do it better, but you, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And so you gotta be able to get in there and you have to just have the confidence and know that if you have done the homework, and again, I echo some of the comments earlier that you got to make sure that you're you're jumping into something that you're qualified for, and that you're and that you're you're being excellent at what you do, and that you're researching, and that you're um, you're getting ed educated and skill sets up, and all of those things. But once those things are in place, it's 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 yours to lose, and you, you just have to. I, I'm always. Um, Say, I'll t you know, I'm taking no prisoners. I'm in there, and <laughs> you're going to have to move me out. And I think that's the attitude that um, I think women can have and should have, and I encourage that because I see it oftentimes, you know, uh, so many times repeatedly in our male counterparts. They, they, don't, they don't blink. They don't blink at jumping in for everything and for the, everything for them for the taking. So. And speaking of Can I men, just add something? Um, oh, yeah, go ahead, Chris. Can I just... Can I just jump on that really quick? Because yeah, that's a hundred percent correct. And I want to add to that that women also don't know their value. If I have a position that I'm hiring for for one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, the men ask for one seventy five and the women ask for one twenty five. Always, always. It's because we have to embrace the fact that we're female. But if we want to be strong women, women, we need to recognize our value and ask for more than we think we're worth. Because even though we're strong women, we don't even recognize what we're worth because we're still women and we still care and we make different decisions differently than men do. So we have to embrace that and make sure you understand your value and you get what you deserve. And I'll just say that's what my male mentors have really helped. What what they have taught me is, is sometimes you don't you don't know where you don't really know where to start negotiating, right? But the men always go high. And what I've learned is I you know, I've had them tell me repeatedly when I'm not negotiating with them, but when they're my mentors, they're like, No, you need to go in there and, and just say something. If it doesn't make you feel uncomfortable, you're not the numbers aren't high enough. And I just also would like to add to that is, you know, sometimes being the person who knows the least is your advantage because it's going to mean you think about stuff differently than the way everyone else has always done it. There isn't a business like Girls Auto Clinic in the world, right? And I'm coming in as an outsider. I don't know anything about this. And I'm like, why isn't anybody doing this? I don't understand. <laughs> so it actually can be your advantage. Embrace that, right? But learn about the industry. That doesn't mean that you still don't need to learn how it works or how to run a business in it. But being fresh and being new is, can actually be an advantage. So recognize that and use it to, to your power. I, I, I love everything that you guys have been saying. And, and we have another question coming in, speaking of men. And uh, the question is, I'll let anyone kind of take a stab at this. It says, do you have advice for working in tandem with men while making sure that you advocate for yourself and for the other women on your team? Anyone in particular want to? Yvette, go ahead. 
my whole industry is completely male dominated, especially the genre that I play, like technical guitar. There's really not a lot of representation with women. And I think a large part of my success so far has to do with the fact that I am a minority in my field, like being an Asian woman, like it's kind of stereotype defying, right? Like I'm supposed to be like the quiet, submissive and like playing classical music, which is what I was brought up in, but I, I deviated from that. So I think a lot of times working with men has been uh, defying their expectations. And I was going to even mention earlier, like setting boundaries, a lot of like, that's been a really important skill that I've had to develop working with men. Um, it's really tricky because my field, <laughs> I'm going to be real. It's kind of a sleazy field, right? Like there's uh, a lot of just, um, violation of boundaries and like conflict of interest and stuff. And I feel like I've been in a lot of situations where I had to work in tandem with men and they've made an advance and I had, to, I, I had to figure out a clever way to still maintain professionalism without, uh, burning the bridge. So it's like actually so immensely exhausting to be in this field. Cause you always have to learn how to set up strong boundaries and walls, but still be able to like work with them. So, uh, I guess, yeah, going back to the whole boundaries thing, um, I've had to figure out ways to teach people how I want to be treated and also to teach people what I think my value is. And uh, doing that, I guess, in my field is is tricky. I guess it's just through communication and also through your actions. We have a, a couple quick questions. Molly, um, Patrice, Molly wants to know, where is your location? Because she wants an oil change and a manager. <laughs> <laughs> I was on mute, sorry. Uh, we're located uh, just outside of West Philly in Upper Darby on Westchester Pike, um, right up Market Street. So 7425 Westchester Pike, Upper Darby, or just Google Girls Auto Clinic, you'll find us. Give us a call and yeah, we'll hook you up. Oil change and tire rotation and Manny Petty. <laughs> Um, another question, Patrice, do you happen to run into mansplaining? I would love you do to try to explain car stuff and for her to just drop all the knowledge she has. <laughs> uh, I do run into mansplaining a lot, but I don't spend a lot of time on it because I'm not here for men. I'm here for women. And if mm -hmm. I'm going to be explaining something to people, it's going to be for women. Um, I don't need to drop my knowledge on them. In fact, I don't like to tell people I'm an engineer. Whenever I'm promoting Girls Auto Clinic, I don't say it. And they look at me, because especially because I wear my red heels, you know, it's part of my logo, and they want to challenge me. And, you know, I'm like, I'm not here for you. I'm not, I don't need to answer your questions. I don't need to look smart for you. Um, you're not who my customer, right, or, or my target customer. Uh, so I don't, I don't really waste my time with them. <laughs> Uh, for mansplaining, but um, sometimes I'll drop the, I'm an engineer, you know, I went to Lehigh University if I feel the need to, but ultimately, who cares what they think? <laughs> um, Chris, people also want to know where you're located because they need some cannabis in their life. <laughs> <laughs> All right. doesn't. <laughs> I am in Abington Township, Montgomery County, Sellersville, Bucks County, and Malvern, Chester County. We have three locations, and um, our website's terravitahc.com, and we have live customer service help there. I'm not sure how much more time we have, but um, this might be the last question. This is for everyone, and we're going to start with Yvette. Um, we've all kind of talked about the different challenges that you've had to overcome throughout your career or your journey with owning a business. What would you say now? If you were to flex just a little bit, what would you say now to the people who doubted you and didn't believe you in the beginning? Yvette. Um, I don't, I feel like I don't really have anything to say. Like, I think everything that I do, I can just show with my actions. I think actions always speak way louder than words. And uh, I guess the best way to stick up for yourself is just to kill it with your actions and act with a, I guess, grace and dignity. So I think I can just show these people <laughs> instead of having anything to say to them. Yeah, I love it. Uh, Chris, what would you say to all those people who belittled you, talked down to you, doubted you? A lot of people didn't talk down to me over time. <clears throat> but one of the things that was interesting was 
there was a huge expectation of who I would be in the future. I was going to go to Harvard, and I was going to be president of the United States because that's the one thing people told me I couldn't be. That was the only thing anyone ever told me that I couldn't be. When I got to college, I felt like I was suffocating, and I was being put in a box. So I don't have a college degree, and I run an enormous company. What I say to everybody who doubted me is they doubted me because I didn't get a degree. And I never cared. But there's been so much weight put on a piece of paper and an education where most people have no return on investment in that. And we have an entire generation of people that think they have to go to college to be successful in life. So I'll tell everybody that doubted me, I was right, you were wrong. And I would tell all the young people out there, we need service professionals. We need auto mechanics. I need an electrician that I would like to be able to call and get one in an hour. So whatever your passion is, if you're an artist, you don't have to go to school. You don't have to show someone a piece of paper to get there. If you're going to spend $280,000 of your money or your parents' money to do what you already knew how to do. Education is important, but the piece of paper doesn't have to be unless you want to be a doctor, a lawyer, or a licensed professional. Dixie Ann, what do you say to those people? Um, well, I don't know that I don't know that I know who my daughters were because uh, you know I don't know that I've ever paid a lot of attention to them. But if they're out there, I guess in the you know the words of uh, Chris Brown, I'd say, "Look at me now." But um, but uh, but, no, but in all seriousness, I, I do I do think uh, Yvette's right. You know, um, hopefully they're inspired, and you know it changes the way that they interact with other people and that they don't put their limited thinking uh, uh, and, and forecast their limitations on other people. And because I do think that stops a lot of people from, um, they, they move from great back to good in their own thinking and the own things that they could accomplish. So I, I would have just hoped that some of those doubters then change their ways and, and um, encourage people to, to be whatever they can be, so. And then Patrice. Yeah, you mentioned Chris Brown. I was thinking of the Trinidad James quote, don't believe me, just watch, <laughs> right? Um, and another, quote, another quote I think of is Steve Jobs, where he said, you can't connect the dots until you look back. And when I look at my journey from, you know, how I grew up and being the first generation going to college and becoming an engineer and then owning this business, I realized that I have been preparing my whole life for Girls Auto Clinic, right? You're not stopping me. You're, you, don't, you can't stop Beyonce Shine. You can't stop Patrice Banks. So I don't care how much you doubt me, right? Like, this is what I'm here to do, and I'm going to make it happen. And that's the kind of confidence I lead with every day, um, is knowing that this is meant for me, and no one's going to stop me. Perfect. Well, ladies, we have one minute left, so everyone has about 15 seconds. For the people who um, just soaked in everything you just said, they want to connect with you, they want to follow your brand, they want to consume your products and your services. How can they connect with you outside of this, um, Dixie? Dixie, I'm sorry. Uh, Dixie's fine, actually. Um, well, I am I am not on uh, social media. Einstein Healthcare Network obviously is uh, on Facebook and um, Twitter and, and uh, Instagram. But I personally, Dixie James, you can find me on LinkedIn. Shoot me a message. Um, it's the best way to reach me. Yvette, how can people connect with you? Um, my Instagram handle is at Yvette Young, Y-V-E-T-T-E-Y-O-U-N-G. And uh, if you want to follow my band, it's Covet Band at C-O-V-E-T-B-A-N-D. Chris. Uh, we are all over the place. Um, Instagram is at Terabita HC. We're on Facebook. I am also on LinkedIn. We try to get back to everybody through LinkedIn, but I have a lot of volume through there, so social media is probably the best way. And again, our website is terravitahc.com. And last, Patrice. Yes, uh, you can go to our website, girlsautoclinic.com, and all of our social media handles are at Girls Auto Clinic. That's Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, at Girls Auto Clinic. Um, you can text us or call us right from your app or uh, from the website if you need to set up an appointment. Perfect. And then for anyone wanting to connect with you, you can find me on LinkedIn, Karina Glover. 
And then my company, her headquarters is all one word. You can find us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. Thank you all for stopping into this session. Thank you, ladies, for your time. I hope all of you attendees enjoy the rest of the conference and don't forget to tune in tomorrow for the final day. Um, amazing conference. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You guys are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.